Welcome to the MSQL Tips webcast, Understanding Windows Server Cluster Quorum Options for SQL Server Clustering in the Cloud, sponsored by Sios Technology. I'm Greg Robidoux, co-founder of MSQL Tips and today's webcast host. Our presenter today is Dave Birmingham, who's a Microsoft Cloud and Data Center Management MVP. Today, Dave will share how to properly protect SQL Server in the cloud. Before we get started, if you have any questions, you can submit that any time during the webcast by entering your questions in your question area in the presentation controls. We want to make this session as interactive as possible, so please ask questions throughout, and we'll try to answer those as quickly as they come in. If you're not already a member of the MSQL Tips community, we invite you to join. You can go to www.mssqltips.com, sign up for our newsletter, read any of our tips, download white papers, and watch on-demand videos. This webcast will be recorded and archived for future playback, and you'll receive a follow-up email with links after today's event to download the slides as well as check out the archive. So at this time, I'm turning things over to Dave, and he can get started. Great, thanks, Greg. So um, today's webinar title, Understanding Windows Server Clustering Quorum Options for SQL Server Clustering in the Cloud, that's quite a mouthful. Really, to summarize it, to pretty much everything you wanted to know about the cluster quorum. Um, we're going to talk about some cloud-specific uh, considerations, but everything we're talking about today is about uh, the quorum. It really is going to apply on all platforms, whether it's physical, virtual, cloud instances. As once again, my name is Dave Birmingham. I work for Science Technology, coming up on 14 years now. I'm currently a senior technical evangelist. Silos is a company that uh, historically has been focused on high availability and disaster recovery solutions for Windows and Linux. So it's really given me the opportunity to focus on the high availability space. And for the past so six or seven years, I've been a Microsoft uh, MVP, originally in clustering technology in the past two years uh, in the cloud and data center. And so that's a lot of my focus now is in uh, cloud and, and high availability. So as Greg mentioned, you know, I want this session to be very interactive. So I'm going to ask Greg to interrupt me as questions come in. So as we go through the discussion, if you have any specific questions, feel free to just put them right in the chat window and we'll address them as we go. And we'll have a little bit of time at the end to address any remaining questions. So let's jump right in. So the first question is, what is a cluster quorum? And, uh, you know, Rob Hinman is a friend of mine and the senior program manager at Microsoft in the uh, clustering technology def defines it as the quorum configuration in a failover cluster determines the number of failures that the cluster can sustain while still remaining online. So we'll talk about that some, but basically, just like any other quorum you think of, you need to have typically a majority of votes in order for something to happen. If you have less than a majority, that's not usually a good thing. So we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. And really that, that concept of the majority uh, determining your clusters, it's been the, um, the way that Microsoft has determined the quorum ever since Windows Server 2003. Um, they introduced the majority node set quorum, which we'll talk about, which replaced the legacy disk only based quorum, which really wasn't a great solution because your disk represented a single point of failure in your cluster. So um, that's still out there, but uh, I think it's kind of legacy and deprecated. So we're going to focus on, on node majority sets as well as the various types of witnesses that can participate in a node majority set. But before we move even further, so why are we even concerned about clustering? What does this have to do with my SQL Server implementation? Well, if you're deploying SQL Server and you want high availability, you have typically one of two options. You either have the always-on availability groups, which was introduced with SQL 2012, uh, which kind of uh, replaced the deprecated database mirroring option that they had or you're going to use Windows Server fill of a clustering, which has been in the product oh, ever since, as far as I can remember. I don't know the exact you know, version that came in, but it's a long time ago. It's been a uh, tried and true solution that, uh, that people use for high availability. But both of those solutions, the underlying infrastructure for the availability relies on Windows Server fill of a clustering, 
which relies on the quorum to decide which node is going to come online. So that's my, you really need to understand what a cluster quorum is and how to configure it optimally for your environment. So let's jump right in. I mentioned this thing called a majority node set. So pictured here is a three node cluster, a three node SQL server cluster. And in a cluster, each node typically gets one vote. And so we have three votes in our cluster. And so if I have a failure of, let's say this primary node goes offline. Well, node two and three represents two votes out of a possible three. So it can form a majority and it will do that. And the quorum will then decide we're gonna move SQL Server over to one of these remaining nodes. And that works great. Uh, no majority set, everything works as planned. But what happens, say, if you had simply just a, a two node cluster? So we get rid of this guy, we get rid of this guy. And in the same scenario, where I have two votes, right? And I have a failure of node one. Well, node two remains, but he's one vote, but the whole cluster only has two votes. One out of two is not a majority, so we can't have failover. So node two will not fail over. So your, cut, your cluster is offline. Nothing fell over as you were hoping. So you have, to, um, you have to do something to address that. So what we do in that scenario is we're going to add a, um, a witness. Uh, and what we're going to talk about the witness in a second. Um, here we go. So we have, instead of just two votes in our cluster with node one and node two, now we have a third vote. And there are three types of witnesses that we can have in our cluster. We can have, I uh, mentioned earlier, we have a disk witness. So if we have a shared storage cluster, so typically a failover cluster instance, we can use a small partition on that uh, SAN to act as a vote in our cluster. So in that same scenario where I have a failure of node one, now node two and the SAN can form a, a majority because two out of three votes will do that. So in that case, SQL Server will fail over. Everything's going to be great. I get this question all the time where someone's concerned about their witness. I say, Dave, well, but now, now my witness represents a single point of failure. What if that fails? My cluster's going to go offline and that, that's going to be bad, right? Wrong. So what happens is if my witness fails. Well, I still have two votes. Node one and node two represent two out of three. So I can lose my witness, whether it's you know disk or, or file share or, or cloud witness, which we'll talk about in, in, in a minute. But it doesn't really matter. I lose my witness. I still have two out of three votes. So everything's just going to keep working. In this scenario, nothing's going to happen because node one is still healthy. And node two is still healthy, so it's just going to keep chugging along on node one without um, causing any sort of failover. So you can relax. Your witness does not represent a single point of failure. Let's um, move forward here. So we're talking about witnesses. Um, now, what if I'm doing an always on availability group or I'm building a SANless cluster with you know, a product like Cyrus Data Keeper where there is no SAN, there is no shared storage. So Microsoft introduced this concept of a file share witness. So we can leverage any other Windows server in our domain and it's going to act as a vote. So we basically create a very simple file share and we give the cluster um, read, write access to that file share. And so now this simple file server acts as a vote in our cluster. So this is how we're going to implement high availability, you know, for always on availability groups or for the SAMS clusters. And the same concepts apply with the file share witness. You know, I can lose my file share witness, right? And my cluster is going to keep on working without, you know, without any downtime. So that's a good thing. Now, with the with the introduction of Windows Server 2016, and this 
should say cloud witness. I just want to update as we go. We introduced something called um, a cloud witness. So Windows Server, um, uh, Microsoft Azure has a storage service that we can leverage to act as a vote in our cluster. And it's a very easy process to do um, where you're going to basically provision a storage account and you're going to then use that storage account so that my nodes can um, both, as long as they can both access that. So that's one thing to consider. Um, th these two nodes need to be able to talk to the public cloud in order to leverage a cloud witness. But as long as they can talk to the public cloud, now I have another option that doesn't even require a third server to act as a witness and I can still have high availability. This is great for really two scenarios that this is such a, uh, an awesome solution for. One is where I had multi-site cluster configurations where maybe node one was in Chicago and node two was in Dallas and I, I wanted a disaster recovery solution. Well, before the availability of the cloud witness, I would tell you, you must place your, your disk witness or your, your file share witness in a third geographic location. And the reason being, if I put my file share witness, say I put my file share witness in the same site as node one, well, if I lost that site, then I lost both my votes at the same time and node two wouldn't fail over. So for, you know, for redundancy purposes and to assure automatic failover, we, we always recommend it to put that node, uh, that witness in a third location. That could be, you know, uh, at an expense or just really physically impossible if you don't have three data centers. So if the introduction of the cloud witness that has eliminated the need for that third data center in those multi-site configuration options. The other scenario I see this being very um, advantageous is in small offices, remote office, branch office, where you might only have two physical servers. So um, you might have configuration where I have two servers, maybe they're running Hyper-V and I have a couple of virtual machines running uh, on each server and I wanna have some redundancy but you know, without a third server or without a SAN, uh, because again, it's a small office, you're not gonna put a SAN in every you know, remote office that you have. Now you can build a two node cluster and leveraging Azure um, uh, cloud business for your cluster, you can still have high availability. So you can build out a two node cluster and either you know, building clusters within the virtual machines or even building a Hyper-V cluster itself so that the virtual machines that are running your workloads, your SQL servers and your application servers and whatever else you're running, you can have that two node SQL server cluster um, and, and leverage a file share witness and, and have a high availability. And of course, without a SAN, you're going to have to leverage either, you know, for SQL server, always on availability groups or the, you know, the FIOS data keeper solution, uh, and for Hyper-V, without a SAN, you, you definitely have to leverage the um, Science Data Keeper solution for the replication uh, part of the puzzle. And we'll talk about that at the end. Um, so here's the problem. Let's jump back a couple of slides. What if I had a, a four node cluster and node one, node two, node three, node four? And that's great. I have extra servers, you think more redundancy so now if I um, fail node one, that's great. SQL will move to node two. That works great. Now what happens if, I, if node two fails? Well, you would hope that you, know, you have two nodes available so you should be able to fail over to one of these nodes. However, two out of four is not a majority. And so your cluster is offline. There's nothing you can do about it. You don't have a majority, so that's um, not a good, not a good situation. Microsoft recognized that, and they've made some improvements. And one of those improvements is something called Dynamic Quorum. This was introduced in Windows Server 2012, where the they will adjust the number of votes in your cluster as nodes start to to fall out. 
So in this configuration, uh, same as before, we have um, node one, node two, node three, node four. I've also configured a file share witness in my cluster. So I have a total of five votes, okay? Five votes, and that's what represent up here. I have five votes in my cluster, okay? And so same scenario, let me um, lose node one. So we lose node one, that's okay. I still have four out of five votes. And um, so we'll come, we'll come online. And I could lose um, node two and it would still come online. But let's say, let's uh, imagine for a minute that we didn't have this file share witness. And we're back to the original concept of four node cluster. So I lose uh, node one, we fail over. I lose node two. Now, uh, without this concept of dynamic quorum, we would be offline. But what happens instead, if you're running Windows Server 2012, as soon as I lose node one, Microsoft will update my, uh, my node count from four, which was the original with just four nodes. It would update my node count to just three. And so now I have three nodes in my cluster. And so if I lose node two, now I have two out of three nodes and it will, um, it will come online on node three because two out of three is majority. And now even further, now I have two nodes in my cluster. If I were to lose, uh, what happens now is Microsoft, when Microsoft adjusts the quorum, it's always looking to, to make it an even number because an odd number is never a good thing because if you lose uh, half of it, it's gonna go offline. So with just two nodes remaining, it will change the quorum count to just one. And so it will remove the, the, the vote from one of these nodes. And so that I could potentially uh, lose all three nodes and as long as I have a witness available, node four will come online. So that's the concept of dynamic quorum. Um, and that, that's great, it was introduced in Windows Server 2012. But the problem with that is if we go back to where we were with um, a, a witness in this configuration, the witness never goes offline. So it, it could actually have, give you a, a lower level of avail availability. Um, with, the, with the introduction of Windows Server 2012 R2, not only did they fix uh, they have the dynamic quorum, but they also have a dynamic witness. So as I mentioned earlier, it's always best to have a, um, a odd number of votes in your cluster. Um, because if you only have, the, like I said earlier, if you have four nodes and you lose two, well, two out of four is not a majority and that's a bad thing. So it's always best to have this witness out here voting um, in your cluster. But let's talk about this scenario with the dynamic witness. In this configuration, if I lose, um, if I lose this, this server, let's bring this all the way to the front. If I lose node one, um, node two will come online, the SQL server, right? But now I have four votes in my cluster. Without the dynamic witness, I would have File share witness is one, no two, no three, no four. That's four votes in my cluster. If I happen to lose um, node two or three suddenly, without, you know, maybe they sit in the same rack and that rack had a, a failure. If I, if, I lose, if I lose these um, at the same time, I lost two out of four votes no two, even though he's working just fine and he can talk to the file share witness, he would go offline and that's a bad thing and we don't want that to happen. So with the dynamic witness, what happens instead, as I lose, um, as I lose node one, what Microsoft recognizes that node two, three, four, and the witness represent four votes. Like I said, even number of votes, not a good thing. So instead what they'll do is, um, as I lose this node, it will actually take the vote away from the file share witness. So um, we'll just delete that. 
So he doesn't have a vote. So now my cluster has three votes. And so I could lose this server. And he and um, two out of three is majority. So this will still step over here. And now after I lose this node, Microsoft says, hold on now. I only have two nodes left. Let's give this guy his vote back. So we're going to give him a vote back. Whoop. Um, let's do this. Um, we're going to give him his, uh, his vote back. And now, even though I lost that other node, I still have three votes in my cluster. So now I can actually go ahead and lose the three. The three will go, and uh, even though I lost all three of my nodes, node four will still come online because node four and the file share witness represents two votes. Two out of three is a majority, and it will come online. So that's the benefit of dynamic witness. It will actually control whether the file share witness or any witness, whether it's cloud, file share, disk witness, it controls whether he has a vote in the cluster. And that's going to give you a much higher level of availability than just dynamic quorum alone. So the guidance as of Windows Server 2012 R2 is to always configure a witness. Prior to that, you really only configured a witness if the witness made you have an odd number of votes. So in a two node cluster, you would configure a witness. Three node cluster, don't configure a witness because that makes it four votes. But as of 2012 R2 and later, you just go ahead and configure that witness and Microsoft's gonna make sure that you have, um, it, whether you know the witness is gonna be counted in your votes or not, to give you the highest level of availability. So I know this session was on you know cloud and, and quorum and SQL Server. So let's talk about cloud configurations, typical cloud configurations and how you know, quorum, um, you know, some considerations about quorums here. So uh, before we do that, I want to ask Greg to put up, we have just two poll questions to get a feel for where you're at in your um, cloud deployments here. So Greg, why don't you pull them up? All right, first one is launch. So the question is, when are you moving to the cloud? So we just take a couple seconds to answer this and then we'll show the results. And as Dave mentioned after this poll, we'll do another quick poll and that information kind of helped Dave dictate the direction of the webcast. Uh, we get a good amount of votes. Yeah, and, and please, if you, yeah, and as we're, as you're voting, think about, you know, your specific environment. If you have questions, put them in the chat. This is, I want this to be very interactive. Usually I do this, kind of presentation a lot of SQL Saturdays and uh, it's usually a pretty lively discussion because I know people, it's kind of a, you know, if you, if you don't study it, it's a little bit of a confusing topic. And people have a lot of questions about it. So don't, don't be shy about asking something very specific about your environment or what you're thinking about doing. All right, five more seconds and I'll uh, share these results. All right, close it down, I'll share that. So we have 36% said no plans yet, 23% I'm in the middle of a migration, 16% said 12 to 18 months, as well as three to six months, and 9% said six to 12 months. Great. All right, and then we just launched that second poll. So the next question is, which cloud platform are you planning to move to? I've got a good amount of votes in already, so give us another 10 seconds and I'll show these results. All right, I'm going to close this down. All right, we have 57% said Azure, 23% AWS, 9% said private and other, and 2% said Google. 
Yeah, uh, sounds pretty much what I'm seeing um, in the field. You know, um, about a third of you are not, you know, not in the cloud now or have any immediate plans to be there. But the vast majority of you, uh, two thirds of you, just about, are in the cloud or, or moving there now or, or plan to do so in the very near future. Um, I, I, that's that pretty much lines up exactly what I see. When new opportunities come in, um, the majority of them, about that same percentage, are people you know deploying instances in the cloud looking for high availability. So that confirms a lot of what we're seeing here. And then of course the cloud providers, we know Azure and uh, AWS have gotten a, a, a head start uh, in uh, the cloud market and Google just coming out is uh, trying their best to gain some market share. So we'll be interested to see how the, um, the Google uh, uh, cloud platform takes off. So let's move on um, and talk specifically about cloud. So <clears throat> pictured here is uh, configuration, typical configuration that's, you know, 100% cloud. And each cloud provider has very similar concepts. They have the concept of geographic regions in the cloud, and then within geogra each geographic region, there's this concept of availability zones. Um, you know, each vendor has a different name for their availability zone, um, availability zone, you know, in AWS, they coined the name availability zone, I believe. Uh, Microsoft, up till recently, they had something called fault domains, and they still have fault domains, but they're going to also uh, be GAing their own availability zones, which are going to be uh, very similar um, to to um, AWS's, and then Google has uh, fault domains as well. So, essentially, what that is is within a geographic region, they will have these availability zones, which should be totally um, independent of each other, meaning that um, a, a hardware failure in availability zone one should not impact availability zone two. And in many cases, these availability zones will be in different buildings uh, attached to different power grids and cooling systems. So as much um, redundancy as possible without, uh, you know, el el eliminating as many single points of failures between each availability zone as possible. And so when you're building out your, um, your cluster, your SQL Server implementation, whether it's, you know, always on availability groups or you're building a standalone cluster with DataKeeper, you're going to start by putting uh, each node of your cluster in a different availability zone as pictured here but also make sure that you know depending upon what type of witness you're using it and in the cloud you're pretty much limited to a file share witness or the azure cloud witness that witness if you're using a file share witness it needs to reside in an availability zone its own availability zone so you see here i have the witness in zone three and my two nodes in zone one and zone two. And that ensures that the failure of a, an entire zone should only impact one vote of my cluster at a time. So that gives you maximum availability. Now, if you're leveraging a cloud witness, you don't have to worry about that uh, because the cloud witness is its own entity and uh, the, the failure of a single zone shouldn't impact the, uh, the cloud witness. And just because um, you're deploying in maybe maybe AWS is your platform, it really doesn't preclude you from using Azure Cloud Witness as part of your quorum. So um, don't think that the Azure Cloud Witness is only limited to Azure deployments. Uh, you can leverage it, and it actually costs you next to nothing, you know, pennies if that, because um, there's very little um, that, you know read write access to that. So. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. So somebody asked a question. Mm -hmm. If we have a three-node on-premises cluster running Windows 2012 R2 and looking to put another node in the Azure cloud, is this possible if we need to fail over to that Azure node? Mm. 
That's a great question. That that is perfect for this next slide here. So um, four node cluster. I have a three node cluster of pictures here, but we could we make another node out here. It's not a problem. So now all of a sudden we have two nodes on prem, uh, four nodes in the cloud. Is that what they were? Oh, there's a three on prem, right? Three yes. on prem. Yep, exactly. One in the cloud. Exactly. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. So in this scenario. Yeah, you can absolutely do that. Um, now, if you're doing, um, you know, I don't know if you're doing a fill of a cluster instance on prem, uh, and then you want to replicate that to the cloud, you can do that with um, Cytos Data Keeper. This fourth node can be part of the same fill of a cluster instance, um, or I don't know, maybe if you're leveraging always on availability groups. Availability groups, um, I think as of SQL 2016 allows you to have three replicas with doing synchronous replication with automatic failover. So you could do that. And then this third node would be an async uh, replica for disaster recovery. Now, there won't be any automatic failover out there, but um, you can manually recover things to that fourth node. And the quorum, again, because regardless of whether you're doing a failover cluster instance or an availability group, the, all four of these nodes will participate in the same cluster. So they will all by default uh, be part of the quorum configuration. So that would be a four node cluster. So you definitely want to have a, um, a witness. Now, so you can, um, as pictured here, leverage the Azure Cloud witness and so that your witness would reside in Azure. And that gives you, that gives you a you know, very high level of availability, even if you know, the entire Azure stack and you know, the Azure cloud as a whole went away, you would only lose two votes and you still have three votes on-prem, so you, it wouldn't impact your on-premise cluster. It would continue to work. The dynamic quorum would kick in and change your your five votes down to three votes, so you, you even you still have a very high level of availability. Even like for instance, not necessarily you know the entire Azure uh, cloud isn't likely to go away, but you know maybe someone cuts the fiber on uh, you know last time you're building, so you lose connectivity to the to the internet. That's a very viable you know possible uh, scenario you would still have a very highly available configuration on-prem. So that, that you know, catastrophic failure wouldn't impact your availability on-prem. Now, if you don't want to leverage the, um, the Azure uh, Cloud Witness, or maybe you're still running Windows Server 2012 R2 and you can't leverage a Cloud Witness, I would say um, your best bet is to put the file share witness on-prem. So, it, you know, use another little server here, make this your file share witness. And that way you have all four votes uh, of your cluster on-prem. And, um, and, and, you know, in the event of you lose the entire site, right, that's what you're protecting against, a, a catastrophic type failure. Node four will still be here. Of course, it's not going to fail over automatically. It's not going to grab the quorum because if you all of a sudden lost four out of five votes, um, you would you would have to force the quorum online on this uh, cloud witness, and that's a very easy process. We're very well documented. Essentially, you, you you could restart the cluster service with a slash fq switch for force quorum, and you'd be back up and running pretty quickly. So, to answer your question, yes, absolutely, you can um, extend your cluster configuration uh, to the cloud with three on-prem, one on the cloud. That's a very uh, robust solution there for you. All right. Hey, Dave, another question that came in regarding the, this. Uh, the question is about the storage. Uh -huh. So the question is, is the SAN storage just for the local machines and in the cloud, they have a separate set of storage or is the cloud server actually mm -hmm. able to access the SAN storage? Can you just kind of clarify that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. So if you're doing a failover cluster instance, then all three nodes on-prem are going to be attached um, to the local SAN. Now, if you weren't, you know, if you if you weren't replicating to the cloud, then you have a few options. But if you're replicating to the, if your if your fourth node is in the cloud, 
there's no way for you to use any sort of stand-based replication solution like, you know, ENC has SRDF, which if you had another ENC array, you know, out here in your own data center, you could purchase SAN replication software and cluster integration software, and then the SAN would take care of replication. That's not possible when you're considering the cloud because you have no access to the uh, storage and uh, chances are you're not using the same uh, brand of storage that you're using anyway. So you have to look at um, software-based replication like Cyrus Datakeeper Solution. So in this scenario, these three nodes all share a single disk or prem, your, your storage area network. And at the same time, we replicate that data to that fourth node. And this fourth node just has some local attached storage. So in the cloud, in you know, Azure, you got some premium disk, or in, in AWS, you got some EBS, uh, you know, provision IOPS storage, or whatever it might be. It really doesn't matter as far as the data keeper software, uh, we can replicate from any storage, a storage agnostic. As long as you have, let's say your SAN, your, your, your cluster uses an E drive for a log file that's a terabyte, and you have a X drive for your data files that's a terabyte. Well, you're gonna to wanna to have an E drive and an F drive on node four, each a terabyte in size, so that we can create the mirror to that node. And you'll see that, uh, we'll have a quick um, product demo in, in just a moment here, and you'll have a pretty good idea how we can do that. All right, so good questions. Keep them coming. Yep, I just you know, want, it, it, one of the questions too, Dave. So with this uh -huh. scenario then, having stuff on premises and in the cloud, there's the ability in the failover as well as be able to fail back. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, leveraging failover cluster instances, then you're going to be using the DataKeeper solution, which uh, you'll see in, in the demonstration. It integrates with failover clustering so that when node four comes online, it essentially becomes the source of the mirror. And so anything written on node four will then be replicated back to the on-premise cluster. And that happens automatically. And then, you know, so when the disaster has been resolved, um, let's say, for instance, you had a massive power failure of your primary data center. And it wasn't going to come back anytime soon. So you say, you know what, let's enact a disaster recovery plan. Node 4 um, is going to come online, and that can be configured to come online automatically. Even with DataKeeper, we even allow you to do that with asynchronous replication if you're, if you're comfortable with that. If you, if you have a recovery time objective, that is more important than, let's say, your recovery uh, point objective, then configure automatic failover. If you do that, you're just assuming that in the event of a disaster, you're okay with potentially losing a few rights. If you don't want automatic failover, you can configure that as well, and you be, you could be control uh, when to pull pull the switch and bring the node online, and you know, and, and deal with the potential of a few rights of data loss. So um, yeah, so you'll see that that comes on, on online automatically, and then when you could run here for a day, a week, or a year. All those rights are being tracked in a intent log, which is a small fixed size file on node four, so that when the primary data center comes back online, DataKeeper detects that automatically initiates a partial resync. So just the blocks that have changed will be sent over. Once it reaches a mirroring state, at that point, the administrator is going to um, click on in fill clustering, say, bring things back online in my primary data center, and that will switch over automatically as part of the sale of the clustering. We'll see that as well. All right, so um, in this scenario, pictured here, let's keep this third note here, it's a good, uh, good uh, choice. So prior to Windows Server 2016, um, and, I, and, and let's say I wanted to have automatic failover enabled, right? Because I, I want to be sure that my, my DR site comes online even if none of my employees are readily available to, uh, you know, to pull the switch. And that's something you need to consider, you know, in, in any sort of catastrophic failure. 
people generally taking care of their 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 family and their own you know health and safety first. So <laughs> you got to plan for everything. So you might want to have that automatic uh, failover configured. Well, in Windows Server 2012 R2, we have this concept of um, preferred owners. And so you could set a list of preferred owners. Say, well, node one is, um, is first, node two is second, and uh, node three would be third, right, in my list of preferred owners. And so that if node one fails, it will fail to node two. If node two has a failure, it, would, it will fail to node three. And then maybe node four, even if you don't put node four on a list, Microsoft assumes that node four is at the end of your list and puts it there for you anyway. And so if node three fails, it will fail over to node four. That makes sense, right? You, you say, well, that, you know, that, that, that seems to, you know, be exactly what I want um, to happen. However, <clears throat> if someone, um, if you have a front owner's list set like that, and someone's doing maintenance on, on node one, so they move the workload to, to node three temporarily, right? They do the maintenance on node one, and it comes back online. But they never bother to move the workload back from node three to node one. Well, guess what happens if node three, just one single server fails? Well, you think, well, node one is, uh, you know, node one is the top of my preferred owners list, so it should fail over here, right? No, wrong. It's very um, dumb in that it will, uh, prior to Windows 2016, it would actually fail to DR. You say, well, why did it go to DR? I have two perfectly good nodes here on premise, right? So Microsoft fixed that. <laughs> I've been asking them for many years to fix this. They finally fixed it with Windows Server 2016. They introduced something called site preference. And so uh, site preference, and you and a little example here to show you how to configure it. Uh, configure it via PowerShell. First, you create what they call fault domains. So I'm going to create in this PowerShell example two fault domains. I'm going to call the first one Philly, <clears throat> and the second one I'm call Azure. <clears throat> and then once I have my fault domains defined, I'm going to set which nodes are in each fault domain. So I have um, node one, node two, and because I added a, th a third node, I would add. Um, let's see, if I do this here. Oh, I'm pasting the wrong stuff. Copy, copy, paste. This one work. Yeah. So I would add node three to Philly as well. And then I would add node four to my, um, my Azure fault domain. And so what happens is once you define fault domains and you assign memberships, put the nodes in a fault domain, what happens is that the groups fail over to a node within the same site before failing to a node in a different site. So regardless of which node SQL is running on, as long as it's running on a node that's in Philly, it will always try one of the other nodes that are in Philly and will exhaust all those uh, nodes before it fills over to node four in Azure. So this is a huge, especially in those multi-site configurations, this is, this is a very, very, very awesome feature that I just love. So you're gonna to wanna to be familiar with this if you're configuring multi-site clusters set up your site preference and that way you can be sure that in this scenario like i said we have a philly site and the azure site so even if my sql server was running over here and my my preferred owner list was node one node two node three if i failed node two it will try node one first because it's in the same site so site preference with windows server 2016 definitely use it. You might, if you're not, you know, you don't do this every day like I do, you might overlook that new option, but you definitely don't want to, to overlook it. So I know I mentioned a bunch, um, hey Dave. you know, in the demonstration. Yes. Hey, can I just ask one more question that came in? Um, so somebody just had a question about if they have multiple nodes in a, uh, in a cluster and they're just wondering about 
RAM limitations and CPU limitations. So is there any limitations with clustering as far as what can be accessed? Or is it based on the Windows operating system and the version of SQL Server? Yeah, I mean, you're going to want to size, um, preferably, you're going to size each cluster node pretty, you know, pretty similarly. You know, in, in the past, let's say before Windows Server 2008, there used to be a hardware compatibility list. And this is one of the downfalls of clustering in the early days is you, you only could have a supported cluster if your hardware was part of the hardware compatibility list. And um, with Windows Server 2008, they did away with the hardware compatibility list and they added this cluster validation tool. So when you build a cluster, you're going to, um, at the end, when you build a cluster, you're going to run cluster validation. And it's going to take a look at each node. And it's going to look at, um, you know, it's going to look at your networking. It's going to look at your storage. It's going to look at your service pack level. A whole bunch of things. And they keep adding new things um, as for each new Windows release. But essentially, it will call out any configuration options or any hardware um, things of concern and either give you warnings or failures. Now warnings, you know, you can take with a grain of salt, you, you have to understand what they're warning you about. Like for instance, in most cloud configurations like, uh, like this one here, you're typically only using one network interface card. And so they will call that out as a potential single point of failure. Well, we know in the virtual environments that that single network card is probably back on the back end at the hardware level has multiple levels of redundancy so we're not overly concerned about using a single NIC in the cloud or even on your virtual machines so um, to answer your question is there is no set you know you must have x amount of ram you must have the cpu uh, so forth as long as it passes cluster validation you're good to go now in, in reality you want to make sure your machine is powerful enough to run the workload. So I'm not going to have node one be this 16 core, you know, uh, great server that, you know, is running my, my very important SQL server workload and then have my backup server being, you know, an old laptop, right? Because if you run on an old laptop, it's going to go up in flames pretty quickly. So you want to, you know, make sure that your node two is, uh, is you know, going to be able to carry that workload. So ideally, it would be the same type server, but you can, um, you know, you can cheat a little bit, but just realize that, you know, you're, you're going to run, you're going to have to run that workload at some point. Now, that brings up a good um, question. So what about this cloud instance? Well, you know what? The best thing about the cloud is I can provision a smaller instance because I'm paying per core out here, right? So this server has to be running, um, but guess what? For disaster recovery purposes, yeah, you know what? I probably don't want to pay for 16 cores 24-7, 365 days a year when I hopefully never plan on using it. So let's just really scale that down to the minimum that I need. And in the event of a disaster, well, guess what? It only takes a couple minutes to to turn up the knob, you know, let's, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to go from, you know, we have a G1 instance in Azure to a G5 instance. As long as we're in your same family, it's not a big deal. You just, you know, open up the Azure console and say, mm, make this a G5. It'll reboot the server, but you know, in the event of a disaster, another couple of minutes is typically uh, acceptable. And now you're only paying for that large instance size. Um, when you're actually need that that kind of horsepower, so that is you know a great benefit of the cloud. You you probably don't want to pay for that super large instance unless you're actually running over there. All right, so um, I know I, so we're going to have a word from Sios. I work for Sios, so I'm just going to keep talking here. Um, we talked a lot about Data Keeper in, in the presentation, and so I want to tell you a little bit more about Data Keeper and what it is and how it works. So bear with me here to this have a quick slideshow. The time allows a, a very quick demo. Um, traditional clusters, failover cluster instance, looks something like this, shared storage, multiple nodes connected to it. 
that shared storage is not available in the cloud. So what Stiles does is we allow you to leverage the local attached storage and, and keep it replicated with our synchronous block level replication solution for local targets, or you can enable asynchronous for remote replication, maybe across geographic regions for disaster recovery, and then integrate with failure clustering. So now you're building, we call a sandless cluster. So the solution is 95% Microsoft failover clustering, and we're really just providing a storage solution that enables you to build clusters without shared storage, just using local cache storage. So whether it's cloud, which is great, we do a lot of that, but it doesn't matter, physical servers, virtual machines, we do a lot of business in VMware because people want to build guest-based clusters, don't want to use raw device mapping. We enable them to build clusters without raw device mapping in VMware. So lots of different use cases, lots of different configuration options. So picture here, you have a multi-site where two nodes may be locally doing synchronous replication and automatic spillover while continuing to replicate off-site for disaster recovery purposes. So again, this is a true Windows Server failover cluster uh, implementation. Um, the entire instance fails over. And um, we talked about this earlier, we can extend an existing shared storage cluster. We can replicate that off-site for disaster recovery, whether it's your own data center or cloud instance. It's gonna work just great for you. And within the cloud, whether it's EC2 or Azure, or Google, any cloud provider um, that you're looking for high availability, we can, um, we can do that. So you might be thinking, well, Dave, isn't that, you know, I can use always on availability for that, right? And, and I'd say, yes, you can. And, um, and, and there, that's definitely our, our number one competitor. The reasons that we're better, or, or in some scenarios, is we can do, uh, we can do this with SQL Server Standard Edition. So if you're, uh, you know, looking at the cost of Enterprise Edition to get the availability groups feature, then you might want to consider uh, looking at DataKeeper and for a fraction of the cost, uh, still have a super high availability solution uh, while leveraging SQL Server Standard Edition. But it's not just cost alone. There are some features uh, in all zone availability groups that are not supported. So if you need distributed transactions, um, there's limited support with distributed transactions. Um, you can't do anything with SQL 2012 uh, with distributed transactions. SQL 2016 had limited support. Um, you couldn't rep you can only replicate, use distributed transactions across different instances. It wasn't until SQL 2017 where they really addressed um, those limitations. But beyond that, one of the biggest features of um, the using a, a sandless cluster versus the uh, availability group is we replicate the entire instance. So all your system tables, your database, uh, your agent jobs, your logins, your passwords, all, every, every database you add, every schema change you make is automatically protected. So it eases your administration. You don't have to configure availability groups each time you add a new database or drop a database or, or make changes. And, and again, all your system databases fail. So you don't have to manage passwords and users and agent jobs. It all fills over together as a single solution. So it's really a um, great, robust solution. So I'm gonna give you a quick view of that solution. And while I'm doing that, get your questions. I'll, I'll definitely leave a couple minutes at the end to, uh, to address those questions. See if my VPN fails. No. Connect. All right. While I'm waiting to connect, uh, Greg, is there any other questions in the queue? Yes. One question somebody had was related to using Gatekeeper. So, is the Windows failover clustering set up the same exact Windows failover clustering, and that just Data Keeper sits mm -hmm. on top of replicated data, or does it actually replace it? Or yeah, I, that's a good, great question, and um, it leverages. Uh, game is not responding. Okay, um, it does leverage Windows Server failover clustering, which I'm hoping to show you here if my VPN starts connecting. Looks better. Yeah. So again, the solution really is 100% um, 
um, failover clustering. And we're just, you can really think of DataKeeper as a storage solution for failover clustering. So here is um, my demo. So uh, failover clustering, right? I have a two node failover cluster configured with server status one, status two, and I have a SQL Server cluster pre-configured. This is everything you're used to, right? It's a SQL cluster, and it's got the SQL resource, SQL agent, it's got a cluster name, cluster IP address. Here's the magic. We have a DataKeeper volume. This takes the place of a physical disk resource. This DataKeeper volume, if we look at the properties, we can see that's actually a replicated volume. And we see currently the source is size two, it's replicating the size one. And that makes sense because it's SQL Server is currently running on size two, so that would be the source. And we get some basic information about the mirror. Synchronous mirror, it's in a mirroring state, the network it's using, all that from fill over clustering. And I control it just like it's a regular cluster. I wanna move this to back to size one, do that off we fill over cluster manager i don't have to do anything this the data keeper volume goes offline and online essentially reverses the direction of the mirror so now cyrus one is the source uh, and and cyrus two is the target so to get to this point it's very simple we have um, a data keeper interface mmc snap-in and a software that runs on both of these nodes so cyrus one and cyrus two are both running data keeper um, this server overview report gives you a picture of the, the nodes with the local attached storage. This is regular old storage that I just attached to these servers, NTFS formatted, and I'm ready to go. So I'll show you very quickly here. I want to create a replica of the R drive. <clears throat> it's a three-step wizard. Choose the source, Cyrus 1, choose the volume, R drive. You can pitch, pick which network to use for replication traffic. Click next. Choose the target. Status two is the target. IP looks good. Volume looks good. And then here are your options. I said we do synchronous replication for local targets, asynchronous for remote targets. <clears throat> With async, you might want to enable some compression to save on your bandwidth consumption. And you can also specify a maximum bandwidth. Um, that, very handy during the initial mirror creation process so we don't flood your WAN. You can put a limiter on it. And then after the fact, you come back in and open it wide up for ongoing replication. But local target synchronous is all you need. Click done. And that will uh, initiate the replication. And we get a pop up here in a moment that asks us if we want to register this in a cluster. I'll say yes, put that in the cluster. Now, if I jump back to Failover Cluster Manager, I look in my storage, I see this thing called a data keeper volume R in available storage. At this point, I can run my SQL setup, say create a new cluster. It, the cluster recognizes this as a shared disk, even though it's not as replicated disk. Now, for sake of time, I'm not gonna create an entirely new SQL cluster, but I would, I'll show you, this works with any cluster resource. So if I'm building a file server cluster and I wanna use replicated disk, I can do that. So give it a name, give it an IP address. Here's the important part. Select storage. It recognizes the data keeper volume as an available storage type. Click next, next, finish. And now I have a sandless uh, file server cluster. So it's really that simple. I mean, there's if you're familiar with clustering, I showed you everything else you need to know. The data keeper software, it, you just install it, you click you know, next and continue installs on each node and, and now you can build clusters with local attached storage. I know we're just about out of time, so Greg, are there any remaining questions before the top of the hour? Um, actually, before we get to that, I'm just going to launch a, the last poll, just if anybody is interested in getting some more information about um, high availability in the cloud, just let people answer that. And I don't see any other questions, but I guess one question I do have, Dave, that we can help uh, the audience. Is there a place on the SIOS website they can find out more about DataKeeper and the other solutions from SIOS? Yeah, absolutely. Let me I'll throw this last. Well, actually, we've got the, the uh, poll up. So I'm be able to yes. Uh, okay. Talk about yeah, it. I mean, you can email info at us.sios.com. Um, you can visit our website at us.sios.com. That'll have all the contact information. Um, 
If you want to reach out to me directly, I'm on Twitter at Dave Berm, uh, B-E-R-M, or um, email me, david.birmingham at us.sinos.com. Um, so, yeah, you know, definitely reach out to us. We can answer your questions. We can get on the phone with you, do your private, you know, uh, webinar. And um, if you're interested in Data Keeper, we can get you some trial keys out to kick the tires. We're in the Azure marketplace. We're in the Amazon marketplace. Um, we're going to be publishing some information about Google configurations um, pretty soon as well. Uh, we, we are supported in all three um, of the major cloud environments, and really any public or private cloud. Um, if you need high availability, you can leverage our solution. All right, well, we're out of time, so we're going to wrap things up. So thanks, Dave, for sharing all that great information today. And I also want to thank Sios for sponsoring today's event. The webcast was recorded, and you'll receive a follow-up email with links to view the archive. We'll also get a copy of the slides from Dave, and we'll post those for the download as well. Also, please visit msqltips.com to access all of our free SQL Server resources. Once again, I'm Greg Robidoux from MS SQL Tips. Thank you for attending, and have a great day.